So Graham, thank you so much for joining me. Um, you're a BAFTA award-winning screenwriter and comedy writer, is that right? Yep. <coughs> um, but I'm very interested in that you were one of the first kind of high-profile people in the public eye to speak out about what was happening at the Tavistock. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think you were one of the first and why do you think you spoke out when so many people didn't? <coughs> well. I was very naive when I got into this, and I, I, I thought that as soon as people realized what was happening to children in the name of uh, a, a very woolly ideology, everybody would rush to help, mm -hmm. and my voice would be backed up by all the kind of supposedly feminist friends, progressive friends I've made throughout my life, and uh, there was no one. You know, there was in fact there was actually only one person, and that was uh, an actor named named James Dreyfus, oh. who is also a star of uh, sitcoms. Um, and he's because he's similarly isolated. He's had trouble finding work, and uh, he's been left spinning in the wind the way I have. But I just kind of thought, well, once people find out that children are being uh, told that they will become. Um, you know, boys are being told they will become girls if they if they cut off their penises, and and girls are being told they will become real boys if they cut off their breasts. Uh, once they find out that the the medical complications that come with taking cross sex hormones like testosterone um, for for girls, uh, you know, the side effects include osteoporosis, um, early menopause. Everyone who's on testosterone, all these women who are on testosterone will go into early menopause, 30 years too early in some cases. Um, multiple sclerosis is, um, is associated with uh, men taking cross-sex hormones. So I thought, well, all you have to do <laughs> is tell people about all this and um, it will, uh, you know, it will gather momentum and people will try and stop it. But that was six years ago nearly, mm -hmm. and uh, no one did. No one seems to care. It's extraordinary. As I understand it, you were um, in contact with some of the whistle early whistleblowers from the Tavistock. Can you yes. say a bit about that and what sort of things they were telling you and, and how that came about? Well, it wasn't really um, anything other than what they were saying when they were interviewed in, in you know, reports by Lucy Bannerman in the Times. And, uh, uh, you know, there was a famous one where... Um, uh, apparently, uh, there, there, there was a dark joke amongst um, doctors that soon there'd be no gay people left because they were all all being trans, um, and uh, yeah, it would, like just just being in kind of WhatsApp groups with these people, I realised, uh, you know, I kind of th again, I thought that like as 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 clinicians who deal with children that their words would be immediately kind of raised up by people in politics and the entertainment world and, mm. you know, and, and something would be done. Mm. But I found out that they were in exactly the same position I, I was. They lost jobs, they were uh, put through employment tribunals, um, you know, they were c kind of continually investigated, uh, and all because they were uncovering a, a huge medical scandal. Mm. So. I don't know, like that we just kind of, you know, I, I've, I've, I've gotten to know some, you know, some of these people. Um, and uh, yeah, we talk about all sorts of things in, in the groups, but the, the, the kind of horrible fact of what's happening to children is just, it's just there as a yeah. constant, you know. So um, yeah, I didn't really find out anything new from them. I just found out stuff that, that, uh, that was already out there, really, mm. you know. Mm. Okay. Um, and I know you went famously on BBC's News Night. Um, it was around 2020, I believe, you went yeah. on there, which was a time when a lot of people, well, no, very, hardly any of you was talking about it, certainly not on the BBC. Um, and you raised some of the concerns that you had around, that you've, you've spoken about just now. Um, but you were treated with, well, you were 
treated very dismissively and almost ridiculed. Mm. Um, why do you think that the BBC reacted that way? Was it just that particular interviewer or this, is there something bigger going on at the BBC? Well, the, the strange thing about that was that I was treated in such a hostile way when one of their own journalists, Hannah Barnes, was working on uh, Time to Think mm -hmm. and uh, the reports that would lead to Time to Think. So I can only, I can only imagine that there is, a, as, as, as is the case in a lot of institutions, there are power struggles going on between activists who are pushing this ideology and people like Hannah Barnes who, who, are, who are exposing it. Um, I, I would love to speak to Hannah Barnes about the problems she had getting that those Newsnight pieces mm. on, because I'm sure they were significant. But uh, like I think, essentially in the BBC, I think there's a group called the Pride Group, and I think that they, uh, you know, they, their their job and the job of Sarah Smith in that interview was to make sure that nothing I said would actually uh, be absorbed by people mm -hmm. or be acted upon by people. Um, and to that end, they threw at me a pink news headline that was a, that was a, a complete um, misrepresentation of an interview I did. And, um, you know, like, it was very funny. They were, I, saw, I watched it again recently. And they brought, you know, again, as I say, this pink news headline, uh, and they, which mentioned the, the word Nazis. And Sarah Smith ended up using the word Nazi, I think about six times in the interview. <laughs> <laughs> so it's basically, it's an attempt to bl blow as much smoke and confusion around the subject so nothing gets done. And sure mm. enough, it's three years later and we're only beginning to mm. kind of um, uh, stop the harm that's been done to these kids, you know. Yeah, and what, what was it like that moment when you spoke out on Newsnight? And, and I know it's cost you so much. What has it cost you to speak out? against this ideology oh you know everything I lost my family uh, I've lost my I've lost uh, I, I, I I've lost my television writing career um, you know I've kind of because so few journalists are covering this because the cowardice exists along every profession uh, I've ended up having to become a journalist and I cover it like uh, I cover all the stories that aren't really concentrated in mm -hmm. one area anywhere else you know and these are stories of you know, as we, the, the, the kind of scandal of what's happening to children um, and, you know, other scandals, the scandal of what's happening to uh, to women who speak up about it. It's usually women who get punished and, and uh, their careers are, are directly attacked. Like there's a good example, Joanna Cherry at the moment, as we speak, is doing a show in Edinburgh and they need metal detectors on the door, you know, whereas Wes Streeting just, just made the same kind of points that Joanna Cherry makes, but there'll never be mm. metal detectors on his door because he's a man, you know? Mm. So it seemed to me that this was a scandal of, you know, misogyny, a scandal of uh, medicine, uh, uh, a kind of uh, mob rule that had to be broken, had to be kind of addressed. Um, and uh, yeah, as I said, I thought I would have lots of people supporting me because all my positions are progressive left-wing positions mm -hmm. they're entirely consistent with what i've always thought about women's rights and, and children's rights and uh and yet you know there's just dead silence from mm -hmm. from from my former colleagues mm -hmm. you know? so, so three years on since that newsnight interview the tavistock is now in the process well the gender identity service at the tavistock is now in the process of shutting down and it does feel to me like more, there are more voices coming through, certainly than there was three years ago. Yes. Um, what, what do you think about the state of things now? Is it, you know, does it, do you, are you optimistic or does it still feel very much like, um, you know, uh, an uphill struggle? Uh, well, there's kind of two things going on with me. The first is my career, yeah. which I would like to try and get back on, on track. Um, and that is, seems as far away as it always Does has. It? Yeah. Okay. But in terms of the fight, I think in the UK, we've kind of won already. We've kind of, um, we've reversed, you know, the fact that mermaids are under statutory investigation is fantastic. The fact that Tavistock closing is fantastic. There's more, um, there's more scrutiny on how we get, got here. And so as a result, the kind of, uh, 
a completely incoherent set of beliefs that these people have is being exposed, mm. you know. So um, I think we, and, and I know, I know as well that that in the UK we're seen as a kind of beacon for the rest of the world mm, on this yeah. on this matter. So I feel, in terms of the fight, you can relax. We can relax just a tiny bit, mm. you know. Uh, we're we're at the beginning of the end, I think, or or as someone said, the end of the beginning, okay. you know. So. Yeah, I think we're in a good place. And I think the children are a little bit safer here than they are in the States, certainly. Yeah, definitely. I mean, given that you have been, your concerns have been vindicated, why is it that you feel your career, why haven't you got your career back? Or why is that still difficult? Because, for instance, like Pink News ran over 75 stories about me, hit pieces, you know. Uh, Slightly obsessive. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, and Wikipedia is the, the whole page is just basically what trans rights activists think of me. So whenever anyone is looking me up, that's what they go to and they, they, they hear that I'm anti-trans and all this sort of thing. So I always said to friends, like, I, I, my, my career will, will get back on track when this ideology is completely destroyed. Mm -hmm. And that's my, my uh, focus, mm -hmm. you know. I just want to, I want to bury it. I think it's evil. I think it's an evil ideology. Evil to cut bits off children. It's evil to try and, you know, make women lose their livelihoods. Th these are pure evil. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's hard to write comedy <laughs> when, when yeah. pure evil exists in the world and is actually kind of in some areas winning. Mm -hmm. So I thought, uh, yeah, let's defeat the evil. Uh, <laughs> let's yeah. defeat evil, yeah. which is a slightly high, <laughs> high bar. And then we can go back to trying to be funny. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you were, you were talking earlier about how you, um, the idea of it being a kind of a grooming. I mean, do you agree with that? Do, yes. Do you it, see it, it? It, there's so many, I think it's the perfect word. Um, right. I was I was telling you earlier there was a there's a, a speech by a man named Alistair Gunn, um, and uh, he was groomed as a child, and then as he grew older he became a um, someone who hunted down groomers on on online. He said one thing they do is uh, they will establish a relationship with a, with a young man, and they will say, um, yes, well the reason you hate your testicles is because you're you're really a girl. Uh, and it might be, in, but it might be sexy for you to hit your testicles, uh, and just to see, I'll watch, right? Mm. So you have men who are literally online persuading these young men that they're girls, so that they can get sexual pleasure out of uh, fooling them and uh, sometimes mutilating them completely. Mm. So that's like the hardcore, literal definition of grooming. Mm. But there's other forms along the way that are carried out some of it, it some of the grooming is even carried out by people who who think they're being you know incredibly good mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. um but like it's you know if you tell a child that it's even possible they were born in the wrong body that is grooming because it's not true and you're implanting a dangerous idea in a child's head mm -hmm. so i think grooming has always been the perfect word for what's going on. We're all being groomed into accepting things that we shouldn't be accepting. Another example is children's books written by so-called queer uh, creators. Um, you know, they keep slipping in uh, drawings of, of women, of young uh, people with double mastectomies. Yeah, yeah. Just the little stitches on the chest. And uh, this is portrayed as the most wonderful inclusion. You know, and what it's actually doing is, is normalizing the idea that uh, you can find your true self through mutilation, mm. you know. So I always, I, I, I feel very proud because I think I, I was actually the one that popularized that word. Oh, really? Yeah, there was a, there was a social worker whose name was Lisa Muggeridge, mm. and she used to call it grooming, and it was through watching her videos and then uh, uh, finding out how groomers work because groomers they don't just groom children yeah. they crew they groom the family or the society around the child yeah. you know and you know when lisa muggeridge started using this word i i just thought oh my god it's the, it is the perfect word mm -hmm. so i started using it it was picked up by james Lindsay in america but uh, again i just think it's uh, as, as Flaubert said, it's le mot juste, 
you know it's there's no word that that sums up what's happening better than that word it is a mass grooming exercise mm. you know and what do you think how do you think it will develop do you think it's going to fall apart do you think it's going to get stronger what how do you see the future of this i think i think there's going to be i think it may become almost like uh the anabaptists or something it might become a kind of a religion like it is it, it is kind of a religion already with uh, you know, holy mysteries uh, like, uh, you know, men turning into women, women turning into men, people being born into the wrong body. All these are religious ideas. Um, so I think, and, and also there's a lot of people, parents of these kids especially, who have invested so much um, of their uh, of their kind of time and their energy and, and they have broken up uh, relationships with friends who didn't agree with them and all this sort of stuff. So they, they're not, it's going to be hard for them to reverse course. So I have a feeling it's going to survive like pockets, like a cult, mm -hmm. which is what it, again, what it is. But at the moment, it's a kind of cult that's, um, somehow taken over, you know, po political parties and, and, uh, theater groups and, and, uh, you know, it's taken over the whole, uh, kind of, every middle class industry, publishing, theater, mm -hmm. um, journalism. It's all been, it's all kind of, uh, it's all these industries have been captured. I think that might end soon because I think it kind of has to, because they keep getting into legal trouble when they, when they believe all this stuff. Um, but as I say, I think there'll be pockets of people who will never stop believing that mm -hmm. they're gay son is, a, is actually a girl. Mm. I mean, you, you mentioned it's kind of middle class. Do you think this is a middle class movement? Do you think it's something that, um, do you, can we look at it through class terms? Yes, it's, 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 a, a, it's a movement born of privilege. There's no, you know, people who, who are on the breadline or the working poor or whatever it happens to be, they're not, they're not worried about, they, they, they're in no doubt about what sex they are, you know? Um, uh, it's only people who have a lot of time in their hands, who are helicopter parents, parents who want to be best friends with their with their kids, their kids who are in despair because they're worried about global warming. It's a it's a it's a movement born of middle class nihilism, you know. So yeah, I, I do I do think, and I also think that there is a lot of kudos attached to having a trans child. It's almost like getting a promotion as a parent, you know. If you tell a teacher that your child is trans, you're suddenly uh, you're suddenly ensuring that that child receives an extraordinary amount of attention that's different from the attention granted to all the other children. So it's it's like giving your kid a promotion, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, I think again, these are the people who they'll be the they'll be the ones who who linger longest, you know. Um, and you can only kind of hope that they didn't, you know that their, their, their kid just painted their fingernails black and that was the end of it. Mm -hmm. But the, the people who, have, uh, who, who drove their kids to the hospital while they had their breasts removed, mm -hmm. they're the ones that I just, I, I, I really do fear for the psychological and, and physical fallout of this. The NHS is gonna be stretched in about 15 years. You know, mm. because these people are signing up for a lifetime of medical complications. Yeah, that's right. It's it's you know it's not it's over and done with and you regret it. It's actually an ongoing thing yeah. that they have to live with. And there's a there's a there's a trans rights activist in Ireland. Uh, it's a woman who transitioned to be a man uh, named Noah Halpin. And uh, <laughs> you know, I call Noah Noah Hospital Halpin because Noah's always tweeting about. Uh, being on the way to the hospital or coming back from the hospital. And uh, another trans man, a friend of mine, Scott Nugent, he once spoke to her and said, sorry, I'm getting the, the they're both women, but, uh, but, but they, and they both do look like men. But tr uh, Scott, who is trans, spoke to her and said, um, you know, you're always going to the hospital or something like that. And and she says, oh yeah, no, I just have to get a couple of things done or something like that. And, and he said, and she, sorry, Scott said, that's what I used to tell myself. Mm. And th it seems to me that the failure rate for all these procedures mm. is 100%, mm. you know, especially vaginoplasties, which are just appalling. 
you know, it's all experimental. There's a famous um, video by someone called Exu Lansic, and she talks about, there's a, she, she kind of reviews the Jazz Jennings documentary. Mm -hmm. And she pointed out that there's an extraordinary moment when Jazz Jennings is getting the operation at the start of the, uh, at the start of the series, where um, the two surgeons are arguing during the operation. They're, they're actually involved mm -hmm. in an argument. And actually, Lansic says the reason they're arguing is because this is all experimental. They're experimenting mm -hmm. on this kid, and they're arguing because you know it's not it's not a, a routine procedure by any means. It's mm -hmm. actually a very dangerous experimental procedure. And sure enough, Charles Jennings is now massively overweight, incredibly unhappy, you know, obviously suffering from depression, um, and it's all because you know of the it, he's the subject of a live experiment. Mm -hmm. Mm. Um, I guess I think I'm just thinking about how J.K. Rowling is someone that who you know is sort of famous for for her writing, her creative writing, and is now sort of I think she occupies two spaces in people's minds: as the author of Harry Potter, and almost she's almost become as famous for her campaigning mm -hmm. and for speaking out. And I guess you're a bit like that, aren't you? In that you you you, you kind of I now think of you in two ways: I mean, you, mm. as a creative writer, and then as kind of an outspoken. I don't know if you're an activist, or I don't know how you'd want to describe activist this. Activist is fine, I guess. Yeah, I mean, how, what does that feel like to now occupy a kind of a new, I don't know, role or a new kind of, uh, yeah. It's a good question. I, 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 I'm not sure. It, it's funny, you know, when I was writing and I was working in television, I used to hang around in Soho all the time. Now I'm never in Soho, but I'm always in Westminster, <laughs> you know, because I'm so, meeting politicians and... And, and, act, and fellow activists. Um, so it's a strange life. It doesn't really suit me in many ways. Mm. I don't really, um, I, li I do like making jokes and I like, I like being funny with funny people, but I have no respect for them at the moment. My, I have no respect mm. for my old colleagues. Mm. I think they just sat by while children were hurt. So yeah, it's a strange, it's a strange kind of life. But I am kind of getting back into comedy. I do a bit of stand-up comedy now mm. just to exercise that muscle um, where I don't really talk about this subject at all. Uh, and uh, yeah, I keep my, keep my toe in that way. But, mm. um, but yeah, it's a strange new life. It's mm. not something I was expecting. No, I think a lot of people in that position now where life's taken an odd turn yes in terms of things that are happening societally and culturally and um well it's been a, it's been a there basically there there has been an ideological coup hasn't there in all these institutions including um you know the 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 sonia friedman productions who were going to do the father ted musical mm -hmm. which they they are not doing now even though it was completely ready hat trick productions same thing they just um uh, asked me to walk away, offered me £200,000 to walk away from, from the musical, and I refused to do it because, uh, you know, it's immoral to, 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 for a musical, you know, to, to uh, well, anyway, I just refused to mm. do it. I refused to do it because um, I've not done anything wrong. I haven't done anything wrong, and none of them will explain to me what I've done wrong, mm. you know. So, um, uh, so but, but, the problem, as I say, is this ideological coup, which means that, you know, theatres are installing, are, are removing their women's toilets because they've, they've managed to convince themselves there's something non-inclusive about women's, specifically women's the toilets. Space. The yeah, men's toilets are always fine. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, yeah, I, I, again, I cannot really operate in a world where such obvious kind of... Um, evil or incoherence or, or I, you know, in a world where my, my daughter, for instance, is, is, is in danger mm -hmm. and she is in danger in a world where there's no single sex spaces and she can't request, uh, she can't request same sex care. Mm -hmm. um, that's not a safe place for her. And I can't kind of follow her around when she leaves the house, taking care of her. Mm -hmm. So I have to do what I can remotely. To make sure that she she even though that's the world we're living in right now it's not like that in a year or two mm. um and finally graham do you have any regrets about speaking out or the way things have unfolded for you would you do anything differently well you see the problem is like for the most part i've just been the victim of circumstances mm. pink news uh, you know defame defame was written 
over, as I say, over 75 defamatory pieces about me. Uh, Wikipedia is lying about me. Uh, y you don't really have any control. Mm. Newsnight pulled that thing on me. There's, I, I, I've always behaved well before I, before I got uh, thrown off Twitter. I got thrown off Twitter for no reason. They didn't tell me why. Um, and, uh, you know, that kind of damaged my reputation further. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't really see what I could have done yeah. differently. They, they, they were, the, the, the aim was to destroy my life. That was what they set out to do. And, you know, luckily I had the Substack, which is, which is making me enough to earn a living. Uh, but, mm. you know, I'm a stubborn Irishman. I'm not gonna, I'm, 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 you know, I, 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 I particularly enjoy being like a huge rock that they can't right. remove from, from some, you know, from a field, mm. you know? Um, so I'm very proud of that. Mm. And, uh, you know, also it's an interesting thing to be at the center of, uh, of, uh, historic events, yeah, you know? Very much. So, yeah, as a writer in, in many ways, it's invaluable. Mm. I used to say that before all this, I only knew people in the media. And now I know, know no one in the media, but I do know, you know, social workers, teachers, mm. doctors, um, uh, uh, you know, police, police, uh, people in the police force. Um, and I know people from a very, a much wider range of political beliefs. I know mm. people from all across the spectrum now. Um, whereas before I was very tribal, you know? Mm. So, uh, yeah, in many ways it's good. I also found out that people I thought were friends or people I thought were, uh, people I thought, uh, were good people turned out to be, you know, not so impressive. Mm. So that's been a useful thing, a useful though painful thing to realize. Mm. I think it's just, it's so awful what's happened to you. I, I really hope you get back to, I mean, I hope the Father Ted musical can come about at some point. Um, yeah. yeah. But, I guess I speak for a lot of people when I say you know, thank you so much for speaking up for women's rights and for gay people. Um, thank you. It shouldn't be this difficult, <laughs> um, yeah. particularly when we live in a society that keeps going on about you know, people's rights, but actually people that actually challenge genuine harms, yeah. um, you know, experience the things that you experience. So thank you so much. It means, it means a lot to a lot of people. Oh, that's very kind of you. Thank you. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Thank you, Graham. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember, to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.